so before we get into X Factor in Marvel Comics, we need to take a step back and we need to talk about Uncanny X-Men issues number 200 and 201. And the reason why is because these comics are going to give us the early formations of the reasoning behind why X Factor was created in the first place as to why it is that the group came into existence. And as a brief synopsis, what we saw with issue number 200 was the trial of Magneto. And this is where Magneto had submitted himself to the authorities to uh, stand for his crimes against humanity. And this was simply just part of Magneto turning over a new leaf of becoming a reformed person. But over the course of this comic, while we saw that Magneto was exonerated of his charges, we also saw that Professor Xavier began to, uh, to succumb to some sort of illness. Now, for the most part, the illness was of such a degree to where it seemed as though it would have killed him. And so what we see is that Corsair and uh, Lalandra of the Shi'ar Empire uh, meet with Charles Xavier to take him back to, uh, to the Shi'ar Empire for medical treatment. But we don't know exactly how long Xavier is going to be gone or if he's even going to come back at all. And so what Xavier does is he appoints Magneto to be the head of the Xavier Institute in his stead. Now Magneto is a little reluctant to this at first and the reason why is because he's been a foe of the X-Men for almost their entire existence. And so he thinks that the X-Men will almost immediately rebuke him and will refuse to stand by him. But what Charles Xavier says is that as long as Magneto continues this, uh, this lifestyle of reforming his actions, of trying to regain the trust of uh, both mutant kind as well as humanity, that the time will come when the uh, X-Men will begin to trust him as well. And so from here, we switch to issue number 201. And with issue number 201, we see the fallout of what happens when Magneto takes over the Xavier Institute. And for the most part, most of the X-Men have already left at this point, the original X-Men anyway. And uh, while they had initially been saved by the new X-Men from uh, the Living Island, what we also saw was that Cyclops was again the last member left. And so to reference our video on the X-Men, this is the point at which the uh, new X-Men have already been established and Cyclops is still a part of the team. At the same time, Cyclops had been with Madeline Pryor, the clone of Jean Grey, for about a year or so. And Madeline Pryor was pregnant with their son, Nathan Summers. And so uh, Cyclops was in this mindset where he was trying to find a way to balance being a part of the X-Men as well as the uh, impending fatherhood that was coming down the road. And so what he did is he started a duel with uh, Storm. And he told Storm that if she won, that he would step down as the uh, team leader of the X-Men and she would take his place. Storm was ultimately successful in being able to defeat Cyclops. And so Cyclops stepped down, which takes us into uh, X-Factor issue number one. Now, X-Factor was initially written by Bob Layton up until issue number four. And what Bob Layton did here is he made a few changes. He actually reintroduced Jean Grey. And the way that he did this was actually pretty fantastic. One of the uh, coolest ways to reintroduce a character. And what we see as we start off with X-Factor issue number one, is that we're with Cyclops and Madeline Pryor in Anchorage, Alaska. And Cyclops is trying to adapt to this life of not being part of the X-Men. With Cyclops having been part of the X-Men for almost his entire, uh, entire youth as well as his adult life, for the most part, he's still torn between the ideas of uh, maintaining or fighting on behalf of the X-Men and trying to maintain the ideas of Charles Xavier. But he also has a son to raise, and he has a wife that's dependent on him. And so he's torn in a lot of different ways, and this is something that manifests itself in, in, uh, in several forms. But again, for the most part, what Madeline Pryor tells him is that Jean Grey's dead, that he needs to stop focusing on the past. He needs to stop focusing on the uh, on the X-Men, and he needs to focus on his life here at the moment. At this point, we switch to Warren Worthington III, and Warren Worthington is with his uh, longtime friend Candy Southern. And as the two of them are together, Warren gets a phone call from Reed Richards. Initially, Warren is uh, dismissive of the phone call. He tries to blow it off, but once he actually answers the phone and and uh, speaks with Reed Richards, he immediately takes off for New York. From here, we transition to New York as uh, as Warren Worthington is meeting with Reed Richards. And Warren Worthington, of course, uses his wings to fly into the airport. And Reed Richards says this was a terrible idea. And the reason why is because everybody knows that he's a mutant now. And that, for the most part, because there's so much anti-mutant hysteria, he's most likely going to invoke the fear and the ire of almost all the humans within this airport, which, of course, is something that we see happen before the two of them are able to escape back to the Avengers mansion. From this point, 
we learn the other half of the conversation that uh, Warren Worthington was having with Reed Richards. And what Reed Richards tells us is that Jean Grey is alive, that Jean Grey was actually not killed, although we don't know the circumstances yet as to how it was that she's alive in the first place. Because again, after the events of the Dark Phoenix saga, we were left to believe that uh, that Jean Grey had been killed. From here, we switch to the Waldorf Astoria Hotel as Cyclops is arriving to meet with uh, Warren Worthington. And what Warren Worthington has done is he has hired police to uh, effectively block off the entire floor to keep anybody from getting in there. And when Scott Summers arrives, initially the police try to keep him from accessing it until one of them speaks up and says the Cyclops is supposed to be here, at which time they of course uh, allow him through to meet with Warren. And at this point, it seems as though Warren, uh, Warren has already told uh, Cyclops what's going on, that Jean Grey is here. And so as Cyclops is meeting with Jean Grey, he's astounded to see that she is actually alive. He thought that uh, for the most part, maybe it was some kind of a ruse or that perhaps uh, there was something else going on here. And so for him, this is a uh, very real situation, a very stark situation, because again, the feelings that Cyclops had for Jean Grey, the love that he had for her, was something that never went away. And the fact that uh, Madeline Pryor was a clone of Jean Grey and looked identical to her is something that uh, made the situation even more intense for him. From here, we see the two of them reuniting, and we of course see that, uh, again, Scott Summers is trying to get used to what it is that's going on here, and Warren Worthington joins the, the two of them. And what Warren does is he tells us what it is that had taken place. He tells us how it is that Jean Grey uh, was actually alive. And what he tells us is that during the Phoenix saga, when uh, Jean Grey had supposedly become the Phoenix, that Jean Grey was in fact never the Phoenix, that she had never uh, taken on the form of the Phoenix, that what had happened was when the, uh, the shuttle that they were using had crashed into the bottom of Jamaica Bay, that Jean Grey had been placed in a uh, stasis pod and that the Phoenix had taken on her physical form. And Warren tells us that he knows this because at some point along the line, the Avengers had received a call about some kind of an object that was uh, radiating energy from the bottom of Jamaica Bay. And when they arrived there, they found the stasis pod that Jean Grey was being housed in. And so when they opened it up, they actually found Jean Grey inside. And so from here, we see that uh, for the most part, Jean Grey is trying to uh, talk about her experiences, trying to figure out what it is that's been going on. And what she tells us is two things. The first is that her telepathic powers are almost non-existent and that her uh, telekinetic powers have been enhanced several times over. But what she also does is she uh, asks them about what it is that's going on with the X-Men, that things appear to have been changed, that uh, Cyclops and Angel and, and others are no longer part of the X-Men and the X-Men are a new team, as well as the fact that Charles Xavier doesn't appear to be here anymore. And so what she asks them is what role they're playing with regards to being superheroes. Warren Worthington says that he's not a superhero anymore, that he doesn't do that kind of thing anymore, and Cyclops says the same thing. And it's at this point that Jean Grey gets really, really angry. And the reason why is because she feels as though they're abandoning the idea of uh, Charles Xavier's dream, a peaceful coexistence between humans and mutants. And so she immediately takes off for uh, trying to figure out what it is that she wants to do, trying to figure out I don't know, maybe what kind of stance she should take, if she should take any kind of a stance. At this point, she's joined by Warren Worthington, as he'd been following her and uh, trying to keep tabs on her. And what he tells her is that she's right, that it is their responsibility as individuals with superpowers to use those superpowers for the betterment of not just mutant kind, but to also ensure that uh, some measure of peaceful, peaceful coexistence is maintained, if not enhanced, by uh, the relationship between humans and mutants. And so what we do is we switch to the various X-Men or various former uh, original X-Men as we uh, see them going about their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, Beast is attempting to uh, attain a position with the Harvard Medical School, but the Dean of Medicine turns him down due to the fact that the faculty are uh, not very happy with a mutant working with the uh, working in their department. From here, we switch to Bobby Drake, and Bobby Drake is working with some kind of an accounting firm, and he gets a call from someone on behalf of Warren Worthington. And we don't, again, know, necessarily know what the conversation is, but whatever this conversation is indicates that uh, Warren Worthington wants the company of Bobby Drake for presumably some kind of uh, conversation. And Bobby Drake, of course, immediately agrees and takes off to meet with everybody. At this point, 
We pick up about six hours later on uh, the Manhattan Lower East Side in some building that is apparently owned by Warren Worthington. And we see that all the original X-Men have, for the most part, gathered back together. And after everybody, uh, I guess Beast and and, uh, and Bobby Drake and others are surprised to see that uh, Jean Grey is alive, they, of course, uh, meet and they talk and, and catch up and so on until they're actually called into a room with, uh, with Warren Worthington. And what Warren Worthington tells us is that he has brought along his, uh, his college roommate Cameron Hodge. And Cameron Hodge has vast experience in, uh, in PR and marketing, and he's going to basically market the team in such a way to where they'll be receptive by humanity. And initially, no one really knows how this is going to happen. People don't, for the most part, believe this is actually going to take place. And the X-Men, or the original X-Men, are a little less uh, skeptical here. But what Cameron Hodge tells them is that the uh, anti-mutant hysteria is at an all-time high. And so the best way for them to function is to take that mutant hysteria and to turn it on itself. And so what he says is that they are basically going to operate as a group of people who are masquerading as mutant hunters and that they're going to operate under the name of X factor. The reason being because mutants have an X factor uh, in their genetic makeup, which is the reason why they have powers in the first place. And so what he shows them is this 30 second ad that would be uh, that's actually on TV already, whereby people can call a 1-800 number that would lead directly to the phone line and the uh, at the headquarters of X factor to report any kind of suspicious mutant activity. And what X-Factor will do is they will arrive on the scene, they'll masquerade as though they're trying to capture the mutants, and then they'll take them for safekeeping. And so what this is basically doing is allowing them to continue the idea of uh, rescuing mutants from any kind of oppression at the hands of humans in the same way that the Xavier Institute would do with younger mutants. But what it does is it allows them to uh, educate mutants in terms of the appropriate, the proper use of their powers for their greater good, as well as make sure that uh, anti-mutant hysteria stays quelled. And this, for the most part, is how X-Factor functions for the next 70-some-odd issues, because, of course, the original X-Men team leave with issue number 70. And for the most part, over the course of these comics, we're introduced to a, a litany of new characters, a litany of new situations, and all kinds of different stories. And this is what made X-Factor so popular. With the X-Factor comics, by issue number 5, Louis Simonson had taken over. And Louis Simonson had actually uh, spearheaded the idea of a cross over between all the X-Men and X-Factor related titles, the uh, Generation X titles, uh, the New Mutants, uh, X-Men and X-Factor. This was all her idea. And so with X-Factor issue number 13, we saw that Cyclops, who had previously abandoned Madeline Pryor and Nathan Summers at the end of X-Factor issue number one, began this quest to try to find out what it was that had happened to Madeline Pryor and to his son. With X-Factor issue number 15, we saw that Angel lost his wings. Now later on, it's revealed to us this was due to the actions of Cameron Hodge and that Cameron Hodge had actually been uh, working against uh, uh, um, Warren Worthington for quite some time. And with issue number 18, we see that uh, Apocalypse approaches Warren Worthington with the opportunity to replace his wings to uh, restore his ability of flight. And this is when we see the uh, the Horsemen of Apocalypse really begin to take a main stage in uh, Marvel Comics. With issue number 19, we get the first appearance of the Four Horsemen, albeit without the fourth one, without death. With issue number number 24, The Four Horsemen Return, but it's with the uh, the company of Warren Worthington as Archangel or the Horseman Death. With issue number 37, we saw the return of Madeline Pryor during the uh, Inferno tie-ins for X-Factor. And this, of course, was a story whereby Madeline Pryor had effectively uh, become the Goblin Queen, and she had opened a portal between a demon dimension and uh, the Earth-616 dimension in retribution for what it was that had happened with Scott Summers. Uh, with uh, X-Factor issue number 70, the original X-Men team had, in effect, left. They had disbanded, and they had uh, gone back to the uh, to the X-Men proper. And this is where we saw the uh, X-Factor comics begin to switch. By issue number 64, Louis Simonson had already left the X-Factor comics. And so in 1991, with X-Factor issue number 71, the lineup changed. And the lineup now consisted of Strong Guy, Jimmy Madrox, uh, Wolfsbane, Polaris, and Quicksilver. Now, over the course of the publication, after issue number 71 going Going into the 200s and, and beyond, we saw that X Factor, for the most part, their lineup began to change yet again over several times. Of course, we, we would see people like Forge join up with the uh, with the X Factor team. And by the time the House of M story had come around, the X Factor team had moved away from being this uh, team masquerading as mutant hunters to being more or less an investigative team, a team that would investigate all different kinds of scenarios, and they would be based out of Mutant Town. Now, what it is that Marvel chooses to do with the X Factor team?
team going into the future is something we don't really know. Uh, we're not really sure if Marvel is even going to have anything to do with X Factor or if it's if it's possible that the X Factor team has simply run its course and that there's no real interest in X Factor anymore. But again, this is all up for speculation. This is all up for uh, the possibility that Marvel may reinstate the team in 2015 during their uh, their massive summer event. With that being said, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, let me know, and I will catch you guys later. Peace.